Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Today we are studying 2 Kings chapter 17 when Israel, the northern kingdom, falls to Assyria and the Jews were deported to what would become part of modern Syria. Now this whole event is something that we've been working towards for quite a while. By now, you're probably well aware of Israel's history, but I just want to give a quick rundown of what we've covered for the last couple months. I'm going to start in Genesis, but just for a moment, don't don't think we're going to go deep into this. But back in Genesis chapter 1, God creates everything perfect. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sinned, but God gave them a promise in Genesis 3.15 for a deliverer. In Genesis 12, God calls Abraham into covenant with him. And this covenant includes a promise that Abraham's descendants will dwell upon the land, that they'll be as numerous as the stars, and that through one of his descendants, all the world will be blessed. And that's, again, the deliverer that's being promised to Adam and Eve back in Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 49, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, blesses his sons and says that one of his sons, Judah, will have a descendant upon the throne. Now, you'll also remember that at the end of the book of Genesis, Jacob and his family were in Egypt because of the famine. And so the book of Exodus, which is now next in the biblical account, opens with the descendants of Jacob being slaves in Egypt. Well, God raises up Moses to deliver them and bring them back to the land that God had first promised to Abraham back in Genesis 12 and 16. And so the book of Exodus recounts God's deliverance of the Jews from Egypt. But before they go into the promised land, the Lord establishes his covenant with the people. They are to obey him. They are to not be like the nations who are there driving out of the land. They are to be dedicated to him alone. And there were two key passages that the Lord gave them as warnings. Actually, several, but the ones we looked at specifically were Leviticus 18 and Deuteronomy 28 and 29. Leviticus 18, the Lord listed off the specific sins they were not to commit, and he warns them that if they do commit those things, he would cast them from the land. Similarly, in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, the Lord warns them if they did these sins, if they did not follow him and keep the covenant, then they would also have all these curses heaped upon them. Well, back then, the people agreed to the terms of the covenant, and they go into the promised land as the people of God. Well, things kind of start off rocky. They never really go great, and eventually they ask for a king to lead them. That conformed to God's prophecy through Jacob in Genesis 49, and so the Lord gives them a king. The first king was Saul, but you'll remember that Saul tried to make a kingdom for himself. It wasn't about serving the Lord, it was really about serving him and his agenda. And so he was rejected. He's not the deliverer that was promised to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.15. The second king, David, wasn't perfect, but he did at least try to establish a kingdom that was submitted to the Lord. Well, eventually David dies, and so then his son and his descendants become king. But we've been reading about for the last couple weeks about how David's descendants did not follow in his ways. David's grandson, Rehoboam, was such a poor leader that the kingdom split beneath him. And then for the last several days, we've been reading about this divided kingdom, mostly focusing on the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom was in constant rebellion to the Lord. The southern kingdom, we're going to see, was often rebellious to the Lord too, but not as clearly and pointedly rejecting God like in the north. And so all of this is completely contrary to the plans and the promise of the Lord. God was intending to establish a kingdom that would be a solution to the problem of sin and rebellion. The people of his kingdom were to walk in his ways and be a light to the world. But instead, nearly every king and most of the people were not seeking to live as God's people. They were just trying to follow the ways of the world or the ways of their own flesh and what they want. And so they were rebelling against God. And now that brings us to 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17 is not a surprise to us. We could see the writing on the wall all along. God has been warning the northern kingdom for well over 200 years. He had sent them Elijah to prove his power and authority. He had sent them Elisha to demonstrate his love and provision. But still, they rejected him. And for the northern kingdom, for Israel, for the rebellious people, the day of reckoning comes here in 2 Kings 17. Now, the events of 2 Kings 17 did not happen overnight. The people could have recognized what was coming and still called upon the Lord, but they did not. To the north of them was a growing empire called Assyria. There are remnants of the Assyrian Empire still today with Syria in the Middle East. About 10 years earlier, Assyria had marched down from Nineveh and invaded Israel back in chapter 15. When they invaded Israel, they demanded that the Israelites pay them money, like a tribute, like a tax. And so Israel did for a while. And you would think that this would cause them just to call upon the Lord for help, but they didn't. Instead, they took matters into their own hands. And rather than repenting, and back in 2 Kings chapter 16, rather than repenting, they joined forces with Aram and attacked Jerusalem to get rid of King Ahaz of the southern kingdom because he was in alliance with Assyria. 
Now, Ahaz was a bad dude, and the northern kingdom figured if they can get rid of Ahaz, maybe the next kingdom would help them actually fight against Assyria. Well, it didn't work out that way. In 2 Kings 16, verse 7, Ahaz calls upon the Assyrians to help him, and the Assyrians sweep down. They captured Damascus, which would be in northern Israel, and began to deport the people. And so things were not looking good for the northern kingdom. And so now coming to, again, 2 Kings 17, Hoshea is now king over the north. Verse 2 tells us he's yet another evil king. In verse 3, Shalmaneser defeats Hoshea. In verse 5, Shalmaneser invades the whole land. And in verse 6, the northern kingdom fell. That's going to be 722 BC. Verse 6 also tells us that the people were deported. Now, they're deported to a region in Assyria that would later be just kind of setting up the background for the book of Esther. Now, deportation of defeated people was a common battle technique at the time. When an empire would defeat a country, they would often swap out the people, putting one defeated group into the homes of the other defeated group, like literally in the same homes, same workplaces, things like that. Everyone would be disoriented. Everyone would be beholden to the king for survival because they didn't really know what to do. And the empire was then able to tax the daylights out of those people, getting production from that conquered region because it was now being manned and staffed by these deported people. And it'd be confusion, but still it'd be a way of just kind of controlling the people and getting resources out of those conquered regions. So that's the fall of Israel. And a key date for us to remember is 722 BC. That's the year the northern kingdom fell to Assyria. Now, the southern kingdom is going to fall too, but they're not going to fall until 586 BC when they fall to Babylon. And we're going to read about that in about a week or so from now. Okay, so now with all of this, the author of the book of 2 Kings wants us to understand why they fell. This next section in chapter 17 reads like an indictment listing off the sins of the northern kingdom and their violations of their covenant with God. And so verse 7 says, Now this came about because the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up from the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they feared other gods. Remember the terms of the covenant, that they would fear and obey God alone. Well, what does it look like for them to fear the God of the nations? Well, this passage tells us. In verse 8, they walked in the customs of the nations. They basically just did what the other people around them did. Whatever everybody else did, they did too. They looked a lot like the world around them. It says they walked according to the customs of the rebellious leaders. In verse 9, they did secret sins that no one knew about. Well, the Lord did. They also engaged in religious syncretism and mixed the worship of God with worldly practices. In verse 10, they pursued the fertility gods and did things like burn incense to them. They served these idols with the hope of getting the rewards that these idols had promised. You know, the God of fertility would give them more stuff. The God of of, of lightning would give them power. And so in all of this, the Lord had been calling them to repent. Verse 13 says that the Lord had sent them prophets and seers who would say, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments, my statutes, according to the law that I gave you. And yet in verse 14, the people did not. It says they stiffened their necks and continued their rebellion. In verse 15, they followed their vanity and they became vain. They just became like that which they worshipped. And in verse 16, they engaged in idol worship. And in verse 17, they even engaged in child sacrifice, soothsaying, and fortune telling. And so the northern kingdom was in complete rebellion to their covenant with the Lord. And we said a minute ago, this was to establish a kingdom of people who would follow his ways and walk in his commands. The kings were not leading people in the ways of God. The people were not following God. And so after 208 years of rebellion, there was no other option but to remove Israel from God's land. The chapter then concludes with explaining how this deportation worked, and it even gives us an important tidbit in verse 27 where it explains that the king of Assyria actually sends a Jewish priest to the deported people living in Samaria to teach them the ways of the Lord. And although these deported people engage in syncretism, and and they're really not God's people, and and in fact, these people will become the ancestors of the Samaritans that the Jews didn't get along with the New Testaments, and so this is not a good situation. But this is the first of a new sub-theme that we're now going to see as we continue reading through the Old Testament, because the Lord is going to be showing us that He can accomplish His will better through the unbelieving leaders of the Gentiles than through the rebellious leaders of the Jews. We're just going to see that time and again as we go through the rest of the Old Testament. And so that's our passage here, and I think there are clear connections to our own day and age. We've got a lot going on in our world right now. There is major bickering within our country's politics. There is an increasing persecution of Christians around the world. And on the one hand, we live in a sinful world, and we should not be surprised when we see the marks of sin around us. And when we see things, it's not always a sign of God's judgment. But on the other hand, when we see all this going on, we could pursue really one of two courses of actions. One, we could be like the northern kingdom and continue to rebel against God and try to take things into our own hands, pursuing our own wisdom, kind of trying and dabbling here and there. Maybe I'll do this for a little while, I'll do that for a while, hopefully something works. 
or two, we could sweep all of that off the table and simply repent before the Lord and call upon Him and seek to obey Him alone and glorify Him. And when you think about how the Northern Kingdom probably viewed the last 200 years, they, I'm sure, thought they were doing the best thing they could. They were just kind of keeping all options open. They had half-hearted worship of the Lord. They had religious worship centers dotting throughout the land. And these worship centers would teach idol worship, but most of the people probably couldn't really tell the difference because the teaching about the Lord was so thin also. And so in all of this, God was not pleased and he brought judgment upon them. It's not that their idols abandoned them. Those weren't real to begin with. It's that they had walked away from the Lord and therefore no longer saw his blessings and his grace and his strength in their life. Our world is constantly trying to convince us of all the different ways that we can get health and wealth and peace and power. We need to have the discernment to recognize when people are mixing the teaching of the world with the teaching of the Lord. The sooner we recognize that there is a lot of mixture going on around us and we just kind of push all of that aside, the sooner as we come to the place of just fearing God alone and serving Him alone, the sooner we're going to see His work in our own life and His work amongst His people. And as we think about our own circumstances and our own lives, whenever we face a circumstance like the Northern Kingdom does here, where they've got this army besieging them, maybe it's not literally an army, but it might be some kind of situation we can just see the mounting pressures around us. Our response should be to examine our life and make sure that we are fully devoted to the Lord. We should be asking ourselves, who am I truly following? Am I following the Lord, the world, my own opinions? If we're following anything other than the Lord, we need to recognize that's an idol and bring that to him and ask him to crucify it so we would follow him alone. Because as new covenant Christians, we are also in a covenant with God where he is our Lord and King. We're not going to listen to the world around us, but to him. That's the covenant. And that's what he calls us to. Well, with that, we'll end things there. Maybe as you're closing out your time with the Lord, maybe pray about any false idols that might be in your heart. And please be praying for our own country, for our country's leaders, really for the world's leaders to repent and return to the Lord. Well, it has been so great to spend this time with you. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for being on this journey through God's Word together. I look forward to catching with you tomorrow as we read about how Assyria then invades Judah, the southern kingdom. We're going to see a very different result. Until then, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks again, and God bless.